All books of the Bible have some usefulness in understanding their background, uh, authorship, or time frame in order for us to better grasp their actual meaning and intention of the book. However, there is one book in the Bible that is particularly unique uh, for its basis in being included in the inspired works. And that is because we do not know who the author is, and that is the book of Hebrews. There is something that literally all other books of the Bible share in common, and that is their authorship. We know who their author is. And that's important because this is a major factor in the determination of whether or not a book should be included in the canon. If you're not familiar, the word canon refers to the collective group of inspired books that make up the Bible. This group of scriptures we have, uh, the Bible as a collection of books, was established in the fourth century, in the late 300s. It's likely that the books themselves were, were already considered a complete collection a long time prior to this, uh, but this is when they were formally recognized. And it's largely been accepted by nearly all of Christianity since then. So when you hear the word canon, uh, this is what it's referring to, the accepted, inspired books of the Bible. One of the criteria for establishing whether a New Testament book should be in the canon is its apostolic credentials, meaning that if a book was written by an apostle, uh, or perhaps at least someone closely associated to Jesus or perhaps Paul, uh, then this would be considered an inspired work. Well, this is true, and we have the author named for all other books of the Bible. Since the author of Hebrews is not known, the question is, how did Hebrews make it into the canon, and should it be accepted? We'll look at this. First, let's talk about who the author might be. There are generally four people that the book has been credited to with any kind of merit. They are either Paul, Luke, Barnabas, or Apollos. Paul, Luke, Barnabas, or Apollos. My intention is to give you a few of the best pros and cons of each so you can decide which has the best case, if any of them do. First, let's, look at, look at, uh, let's talk about Paul. He's probably the one most traditionally held as the author. However, it's really not a slam dunk, as some would suggest. The book has Pauline elements to it and even has some statements that are essentially the same as found elsewhere in Paul's writings. For example, a near identical passage is found in 1 Corinthians 3 and also in Hebrews 5, which is the concept of milk versus solid food as an allusion to our spiritual maturity. 1 Corinthians is a book we know was written by Paul, but basically the exact same idea is found in Hebrews 5. I mean, they are crazy similar statements on the same subject. Only two scenarios make sense to me for explaining uh, how they could be pretty much the exact same concept and statements. And that is either A, Paul wrote both of them, <laughs> or B, someone who learned or traveled with Paul with, would have learned it from him and used it later, uh, considering that 1 Corinthians was written first, which it probably was. Let's, let's turn to Hebrews 13, 13 and verse 23. The other support for Paul is, as the author, uh, is the book's connection to Timothy. In Hebrews 13, verse 23, this is one area of a clue that tells us something about who the author is. It says here that you should know that our brother Tim Timothy has been released. If he comes soon, he will be with me when I see you. We know Timothy traveled with Paul, so this connection seems plausible, as we might naturally expect the two of them to be together. The issue with this, though, is that Paul always identifies himself in his other letters, uh, not so in this one. So that is something that is uniquely odd or different than his other epistles and makes us question, is this Paul then who actually wrote this? And it's not as if Paul traveled with Timothy exclusively. On the other hand, there are some really big challenges to Paul as the author. First, Paul's Greek style 
uh, from his other letters does not match what we find in Hebrews. And, and this is possibly quite problematic. Uh, Paul is not known for the most polished Greek. Uh, of course, we know that at least sometimes he used a scribe or an amanuensis to dictate what he said, but even those letters have better consistency between them. Hebrews is much more refined Greek, and so it is out of place with Paul's other known works. How things are phrased, uh, the syntax, the grammar, none of it really matches what we find in Paul's other epistles. One early suggestion, though, around this is that the, it's thought that the letter was to possibly a sermon that Paul preached to Jews, and so it had been written down as Paul gave it, or perhaps maybe afterwards, rather than a letter he set out to write. This could also account for why we have so many quotations from the Old Testament, much you know, like we would give a sermon today. Uh, that's important because it's been said that about 17% of the verses in Hebrews is a quotation from the Old Testament, which is by far the highest amount of all New Testament books. So it draws heavily on the Old Testament teaching and explaining their application in the New Covenant. The problem with that view, at least to me, is how the book ends. It's not, it's not written like a sermon. It's better written as, as an actual letter, which I think it's supposed to be. Another reason for the questioning of Paul comes from within the book itself. Please turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2 and verse 3. Paul clearly says in his other letters that he received the gospel not from others, but directly from Jesus. For example, in Galatians chapter 1, he says he received it not from man, but through a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a big point of Paul's, so as to make it clear that he is both operating under and teaching the doctrine of Christ, not of man or any other religion. But in Hebrews 2, verse 3, we have this statement. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. The author here says that they received their gospel not from Jesus directly, but those who heard Jesus, like from the apostles, for example. Now, it's not impossible that Paul could have written this, but it seems unlikely given his other statements on the matter. Okay, another, thought, another person thought to have possibly written it is Luke. Now, Luke is a bit of a viable suggestion. He wrote, of course, the Gospel of Luke, uh, and he also wrote the book of Acts. But those books are known for having some of the best written Greek in the New Testament. So stylistically, Luke seems plausible. One possible hang-up is that Luke was a Greek. Uh, he likely did not have a Jewish background, which we see from Paul's comments about him in Colossians 4. This is important because the book of Hebrews is written from a heavy Jewish standpoint. It is clearly written from someone who knows a lot about the law uh, in Israel and the Old Covenant. Not saying that someone such as Luke could not have well learned these things, and I'm sure he did know them, but he's not the one to necessarily make the arguments uh, that Hebrews makes, just simply because he does not have the background or credentials that it appears the author has. So style-wise, Luke is a maybe for sure. Credential-wise, he's maybe a bit less likely. Other than that, I'm not aware of any other major arguments for or against Luke as the author. The third person then we'll look at is Barnabas. Barnabas is an option for a few reasons, albeit decently good ones. He both traveled, he, he, he both traveled with and supported Paul, as we read from Acts, so we would think that he should be familiar with uh, many of Paul's phrases and approaches to teaching. We also know that Barnabas was a Levite, originally coming from Cyprus. This is motivating because a major focus in Hebrews, which is not discussed anywhere near to this extent elsewhere in Paul's writings, is the emphasis on Jesus being our high priest. A Levite, in particular, would be especially apt and appropriate to talking about this due to the nature of the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies. So, you know, check, <laughs> he has the background. Another point for Barnabas is that his name, 
means son of encouragement. Uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse 36 tells us this directly. And so we have something interesting found in Hebrews 13 and verse 22. So let's have a quick look, Hebrews 13, verse 22. You have to be careful how much you read in to something like this, but it's quite interesting nonetheless and perhaps an indication of the author. It says here in Hebrews 13, 22, uh, as the author is closing out the letter, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. The word in Greek for exhortation is the same word for encouragement. It's the same Greek word both in Acts 4 and in Hebrews 13. It's possible that Barnabas is drawing on the fact that he knows that his audience knows his name means son of encouragement and is using it, in fact, to write a letter of encouragement or exhortation, same thing. So, like I said, it's interesting, it's intriguing, uh, but we should not necessarily say it's conclusive in identifying the author. The fourth and final suggestion we'll look at is Apollos. <clears throat> Apollos was a Jew from Alexandria, and we know he came into contact with Paul at some point. Acts 18.24, in speaking about Apollos, and I'll just read this for you, it says that he was an eloquent speaker, well-versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and with great enthusiasm, he spoke and taught accurately the facts about Jesus. Uh, later in that same chapter, verse 28, it says that he refuted the Jews vigorously in public debate, demonstrating that the Christ was Jesus. The thing is, the book of Hebrews does exactly this. It both elevates and confirms Jesus into the Messiah and the high priest that he is. It shows clearly what Jesus came to replace and what his status is now. Uh, as we're told, he has, a, uh, has inherited a name greater than the angels. So Apollos is certainly someone that has what sounds like the background or underlying foundation to write a book like Hebrews, and also he has the interest. One other interesting point uh, that I'll point out about Apollos is that Paul mentions him in 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, if you recall from earlier where we discussed this briefly, uh, this is where Paul talks about the difference between milk and solid food as an allusion to our spiritual maturity. Uh, something, like I said, that is found almost identically in Hebrews 5. In that same context of milk and solid food, uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul also says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So, as I mentioned earlier, this near identical section about milk versus solid food in both books could indicate that Paul is the author, if he used it in both places. But it could actually indicate Apollos is the author, as Apollos could be drawing on that exchange in 1 Corinthians 3 where he was involved, and then brings it back up in Hebrews where a similar situation existed. It's just an idea, but you can see where there is some credibility to Apollos as the author. However, we don't exactly have any evidence to see Apollos in an apostolic kind of light. And we must have that in order to determine what is inspired scripture or not for the New Testament. Really, what we have for Apollos is that he appears to be, or to have become a teacher or, or possibly a pastor but not necessarily someone who would have written this book, or that he himself uh, carried apostolic authority for the church to accept it as scripture. So these are four people, probably the four best people that we have as possible authors. None of them clearly conclusive, yet none of them we could decisively dismiss. So if we don't know and can't be sure who the author is, why should we accept the book as inspired scripture? This is the question. Well, let's consider what we just went over, the four possible authors. It appears, at least to me, that Paul, Luke, or Barnabas have the best cases. Uh, Apollos is there, of course, but I'm not sure he's a strong enough contender over the others. 
So let's say one of the first three wrote it. Well, even if we don't know which one, uh, it can kind of not matter because we would accept it as inspired scripture regardless since those first three all have apostolic authority. Second, internally in the book, there is nothing said that contradicts or is questionable with other parts of the Bible. This is obviously a good thing. Uh, but actually, more than that, Hebrews gives us things that expound on certain scriptures that we would not fully understand otherwise. Uh, yet when we read it or see the argument that the author is making, uh, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I can see that now. I, I see how that ties in. The author also brings us so much more understanding of the transition or conversion from the Old Covenant to the New, and so this is also very helpful. All of it meshes perfectly and expounds on the rest of scriptures about those subjects. This is strong evidence, I think, for why we can be confident that the book is an inspired work. Hebrews was not easily accepted into the canon due to its anonymity. However, the book's apostolic credentials is considered to be established because of the close connection with Timothy in Hebrews 13. And it appears that the author would have likely been a companion of Paul too. This person, the author, seems to represent apostolic teaching as they are accepted by Timothy and by Paul. On these grounds, as well as what I mentioned earlier about the explanation of other scriptures that it does and that it actually improves our understanding of them, argues strongly for the inspired nature of both the author and the book. It's worth noting that early church fathers, such as Clement of Rome, who died around 99 AD, and Justin Martyr, who died in 165 AD, uh, treated the book of Hebrews as part of these scriptures, even though it's not clear if anyone at that time was sure of the author. Last verse. Let's look at Hebrews 13. 13 and verses 18 and 19. Clearly, the audience <laughs> knew who the author was, since we have the author asking them to pray for him. Hebrews 13, verse 18. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience and a desire to conduct ourselves rightly in every respect. I especially ask you to pray that I may be restored to you very soon. So it's not like no one in history has known who it is. Obviously, the audience knew him and the author knew them. It's just something that has not been recorded or preserved for us. But it has everything else going for it and thus why it should be included in the canon just as it is.